Good evening everybody, welcome to Let's Talk Assassin's Creed, your normal podcast for all things Assassin's Creed. Good evening everybody, and welcome to what I think is episode 133 of Let's Talk Assassin's Creed. I really wish I had the uh, planning document open in front of me, so I could have checked that before I started speaking. But it is, it is, it's episode 133. So now that I've done my totally professional uh, introduction there, a couple of um, points before we get into this episode. So we're going to be talking about the ISU today, and we have a special guest uh, who I'll introduce um, in just a moment. But before we get into that, I will just mention that uh, Declan, uh, he is not well. Um, he has caught COVID. He's a soldier. He's joined us. He's done the intro, but we may not hear too much of him during this recording because he's feeling quite rough. So uh, send your best wishes to Declan. Um, he's okay. He's fueled up with tea, so he'll be okay. But uh, he may just speak a little bit less than uh, the normal today. Anyway, with that being said, Declan, I'm, I'm glad you could join me uh today or this week uh we're also joined by a special guest uh welcome to the show new guest vengar welcome thank you very much for invite, uh, inviting me and uh my sincere greetings to everyone who is listening uh, listening to us uh so just short a bit of introduction uh my name is Ilyas. i've been uh, uh i'm i'm an admin of the russians uh fan group assassin's Creed initiates uh, which started as a translation, as a source of translation to Russian language uh, for all the materials that were available during the when the Initiates website was avail was uh, available. Uh, after it got shut down, we were sort of uh, we became a fan page when we put the when we publish news. Uh, discussions, theories, analysis, and that basically made us uh, well-known in the Russian-speaking community. Uh, I was uh, one of those people who actually got a hand on ISO transliterations, and I've published and I've uh, published uh, this, uh, this the, uh, the topic about uh, the explanation about it in uh, various uh, sites like Reddit or Twitter and uh, among other contributions to the global community that I made are, for example, it's the uh, revelation of the Abbot Chernus, although again, I wasn't alone in this. And uh, over, some, over the time, I did some contributions uh, to publishing theories, uh, other theories for, for the, since 2017. Very interesting. So the, the games, at least the newer games, they are localized or, or dubbed into Russian. But I guess like you're saying, some of the transmedia is not translated. So your team has been translating it um, into the Russian language. Uh, well, in terms of, I mean, all the games, all Assassin's Creed games were subbed and dubbed to Russian language. But uh, in, but in uh, as for the transmedia, not all of it has been translated, and I don't think, especially today, it will be it will be the case considering what's happening in the world. Um, but uh, we we did some translations of the trans uh, transmedia as well. For example, we translated uh, almost uh, the entire trilogy of Last Descendants uh, 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 novels. We also translated. Uh, we were also, we were also the only people who translated the uh, graphic novels *Conspiracies* and *Bloodstone*, and uh, we also translated the uh, fragments, the first, uh, the one that's uh, with Japanese setting. Although currently, as far as I know, it is actually going to be published in Russian. Oh, interesting. Okay, so your team has done a huge amount of work then. We did, yes. So it's uh, it's been a hell of a ride, and kind of we're still active. Uh, although we sort of changed the platform where we have been. Initially, we were in the social media called uh, VK, but uh, we've moved mm. to Telegram. Mm. Understood. So, what's the kind? Of, how how many people are working together to trans? Because some of these books are three, four hundred pages long. So, how many people are working together to do all of these translations? Um, when we translated Last Descendants, actually there were three of us and we uh, spent a lot of our free time doing these translations and we've 
covered uh, the ev the entire book in maybe four or five months. But again, you should consider that they were like fan uh, fan based translations, and it might not be as cohesive in terms of uh, in terms of the Russian language structure as it might be an official trans. Uh, uh, translation. But what's funny thing is uh, one of the Russian translations of Last Descendants actually called the bleeding effect, not like the bleeding effect that we know what it is in Assassin's Creed law, but uh, but it's like uh, someone actually bleeds, and that was very funny. <laughs> that was a very oh. funny thing. <laughs> they they <laughs> translated it literally. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they translated it literally because apparently the translator uh, wasn't. Uh, didn't actually know anything about Assassin's Creed, so he basically translated as as he uh, as he uh, interpreted it. Um, other, but uh, so after Last Descendants, uh, the conspiracies Bloodstone and Fragments were translated by two of us because the third person that helped us uh, sort of uh, got busy again due to personal reasons such as studying and working, and myself and. One of um, one of my colleagues uh, were actually uh, translating the conspiracy in Bloodstone on our own, and actually, I don't think and uh, actually, Blood conspiracy in Bloodstone never released to Russian. And as far as I understand, uh, the pub Russian publishers were actually never aimed to do that because it never got any. It were they they weren't interested in it. Okay, uh, do you have? Um... I don't know what the right word is, whether it's official support or at least unofficial support from Ubisoft to do all of these translations, or do you just do it for your community and Ubisoft don't make any comment? Uh, no, we are actually, we are completely independent in terms of uh, endorsement or any, any of that kind of stuff from Ubisoft. Uh, we did. We do this absolutely voluntarily, and uh, we're not. We didn't ask for any donations or or such because because uh, what we believe as our admin group, we believe we do this because we love it and uh, it makes us happy. So if someone follows us and so or someone comments our articles, theories, and such. With uh, we we consider this the biggest uh, re reward because they actually the the views on the Assassin's Creed aligns to ours and that means we're not alone. Mm. Mm. Understood. Understood. How big's the the audience that that reads the work and reads all of the translations? Uh I think well uh, in VK we had uh, seven thousand subscribers. Uh, after before I joined, it, it was around uh, five thousand. But then it was like, I think it was five years ago when I joined as to the admin group. But then we and then in five years we were in in five years we raised uh, to two thousand. And we were actually in partnership with the official uh, Assassin's Creed fan group and with mm. some of the Mentors mm. Guild guys there. So, yep. um, what, why don't you tell us some of the recent work you've been doing um, with respect to um, to the ISU and, and the long history we have uh, of their uh, their society and so on? Right. So, I think uh, the first part that I've made in the, and of course most of this work wasn't on my own. Again, and I would like to stress on that that uh, I will always credit people. Who helped me with the uh, help me with the mm. researchers and who contribute and who contribute that whether it's actually our uh, my our admin team or even some of the followers or even some of the some some people from the global community is that uh, so uh, the first work was the analysis of the ISO retransmissions from Assassin's Creed Origins. I think we've published this even quicker than Access the Animus uh, again and. I absolutely respect uh, all the work they're doing, uh, and uh, one of the and I think that one got me absolutely excited because it touched one of the topics that uh, that had a, has a lot of potential in terms of uh, development inside the Assassin's Creed universe, 
which is uh, how they lang which is language of time, because uh, these issue with transmissions actually hint towards uh, some of the things like the time is actually a language, uh, the same language as like English language and all such, and uh, and the and the and the and the with transmissions also put uh, put uh, push out the idea that the end of the world that we've seen in the Sanskrit, like in, to, in like in 2012 when Desmond Miles sacrificed himself, it will basically repeat until people will, until someone will hack the time and actually rewrite it. Right. So remind me, are these the messages that Layla hears through Bayek when he explores the tombs and the other kind of ancient facilities in Egypt? Correct. Right. Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, I suppose they're ancient recordings, aren't they? Um, do yes. We know who ma do we know who made the recordings? Uh, I think some of the, the, I think most, most likely these recordings uh, were made uh, by some of the Isu, some of the Isu who actually tried to send message towards the future descendants. I mean, for example, remember how the uh, Minerva sent, recorded the message uh, to Desmond through Ezio. I think it was similar. I think it was something similar, but but in that case, but if we know Minerva pretty much a lot, in this case, they were done anonymously. Well, again, we can, we can pretend it was like a whistleblower trying to uh, yes. warn people like, hey, hey, we have an end of the world going, it will end the world will, uh, will happen again, please do something about it. Uh, I, I like that, that way of thinking about it, that it's a whistleblower trying to hide messages <laughs> for, for humans to find 75,000 years later, um, you know, to, to make them realize there is a deeper truth even than what we think we know. Um, that's, I like that. And uh, one of the, and actually uh, one of the ideas uh, that was actually pushed towards it is that one of the assassins that we know actually was the closest to actually, uh, to uh, understand that language of time and not only read this language but uh, even write in it and basically speak, speak out in it. It was Altair actually. And I, James, I think Declan is raising hand or... He is. I mean, Declan, mate, take it away. Yeah. Yeah. It, it dawned me. I'm just, you know, trying to pipe up when I can even though I literally sound and look like deaf right now. But hey, um, just one quick question because we are. It sounds like we're touching on the empirical truth, and there's one of the wording of the empirical truth has a lot of fans confused because it says basically that time is alive. It's and time is trying to correct correct itself. Isn't it just really? Wouldn't it? Wouldn't that just show that the Isu language is more poetic in the sense that? They're not saying time is trying to correct itself, like time is physically real, but just like a poetic way of putting a spin on that. It's time has a cycle to it, if that makes sense. Uh, you mean uh, by Isu language, you mean the Isu language from Assassin's Creed Valhalla, am I right? Uh, yeah, and in the Empirical Truth, when it's when the recording plays, it says like times trying uh, the nodes of time are broken. They're trying to correct itself. A lot of fans have interpreted it as like fate or they're trying to say like time is like an entity sort of thing, but could it just be that the use of language that, they, that is in the recording is just trying to be poetic, if that makes sense? Uh, I think I have actually, when I was actually, I have a better interpretation of what's been uh, presented as sort of language of time is that uh, uh, I will say controversial. I may say controversial, but when I when we wrote, we wrote the analysis of these Eastern situations, we actually we came to the conclusion that anim that animus is actually not just uh, something that reads time, but it was actually a time machine. However, animus, but animus is uh, restricted in terms of its computing power, so you can only travel with your mind to the past and observe the memories of 
of a certain ancestor or another person. However, you can't influence that. And Layla's animus was sort of the breakout towards it. And actually, and actually, well, if we uh, sort of elaborate on this topic, one of the uh, confirmations that I think that could uh, so sort of one of the arguments that would go for it is that um, first of all, Alt as I said, Altair was some kind of one of the person who's uh, one of the one of the people who actually understood it. Because, because you remember, he he said that uh, he used Apple not only to see the past but the future, and he he said it to Abbas before Abbas's death. Hmm, and uh, and what's and and check this out. Do you remember a Masia of Keys from Revelations? Yes. Yes. Uh, and. Uh, and when Ezio actor took this massive keys, he actually got access to the Altair's memories. So, which which means Altair actually recorded his own memories, memories to these keys, so that someone would use it in the future. Mm. Uh, that 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 was actually one of my and another another uh, arguments for it, as as I interpret it, is that. Um, in Assassin's Creed conspiracies, uh, the well, the uh, Kramer, one of the uh, antagonists and Templars, ha uh, s said about uh, accessing, trying to access the past using Apple of Eden, which and the and that the Glock, the one that's uh, that was in the first volume, was some sort of proto animus. Of, obviously, it was sabotaged by Nicolas again. Sorry if if you didn't read the uh, conspiracies, but uh, conspiracies was a series of comics. Is that right? Uh, there were a series of graphic novels, yes, released yes. by Guillaume Dorison. Okay, I tell you, um, <laughs> over the last few weeks, we've had a few different guests on, and in particular, I want to call out Andrew, who um, hosts the Visions of the Past. Um, assassin's creed law podcast because his knowledge of this stuff is <laughs> it's superb mm -hmm. and i tell you what we've had two conversations with andrew over the last oh, what six weeks declan i suppose and um we've both come away realizing how little we know um about some of the templar law the I, i've just been listening to one of his episodes from from last year where he gives the sort of history of the animus as a device and where it started and there is a yeah. link um between the early animus designs and the memory seals um and yeah there, there is so little that declan and i know about some of this stuff because it is there's a lot of good stuff hidden away in the comics um so yeah it's always always fascinating to hear more that that just isn't covered in the games uh, sorry to interrupt you vengar carry on tell us tell us more. Uh, actually actually you touched a very interesting topic about not covering because um uh, I'll, I'll deviate a bit. Uh, when I uh, before after the uh, no no actually before the uh, Assassin's Creed Bloodstone release, I, I had a chance to interview Guillaume Doris, an author of the com of author of the conspiracies and Bloodstone, and he said to me that uh, he he or oh, he actually believes that the uh, the events of Conspiracy and Blaston wouldn't fit in the game because in that case the gameplay would have been would have to be completely revamped again because yeah. you can't adapt the current RPG gameplay to the uh, settings of uh, 20th century. Uh, but yeah, getting back to the point about the uh, an, about the anim, about the uh, tra time travel and actually in the second volume of the conspiracies, Boris Posh, leader of the assassins, uh, revealed that the uh, revealed that the Templars were regret uh, regret were regretting to give Hitler Hitler the apple of Eden, and he want and they wanted to use uh, uh, the uh, and they wanted to use the apple to travel back in time. And uh, to stop to stop Hitler from giving and ah. stop giving from to Hitler. Yes, and this was the Philadelphia experiment, wasn't it? Yes, 
Yes, yeah. the Philadelphia, Philadelphia experiment actually is another proof that the time is more than people think it is in the in the ESO law, and it has a lot of potential in terms of develop in terms of how it is it can be developed and how it can be used in the in the future of the uh, in the future of the franchise. I think I think one of the followers that after we published this analysis, one follow followers compared it to the Arrival movie. Although I haven't seen Arrival movie, but I see. But if any any one of you saw the Arrival, maybe you might have an idea uh, no, about it. No, I haven't heard of that one. So this was a this was a film, was it? Yes, yes, it was a film, and it has some also similar concept of how time is being uh, treated uh, in the, in the story okay and it's called assassin's creed arrival is it no no it's just it's just called arrival it's not assassin's creed the uh, movie it's just it's just uh, oh uh, it's the hang on a minute i need to quickly yes it's the film with uh what's her name <laughs> <laughs> i can picture her i've watched um oh my god amy adams that's it i can only think of her from um <laughs> from the Disney Princess film, which anyway, that's a totally different. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry if you thought that Assassin's Creed Arrival. No, totally different topic. No, no, no. Yes, the film Arrival is a very interesting film about how it it explores language um, and time. Um, it, it's certainly a film that gets you thinking. That's for sure. So yeah, yeah, you're seeing some parallels, are you, between the story of Arrival and maybe these memory seals and how they might work in the future. Well, it was one of our followers. I haven't actually seen Arrival yet, but uh, I was planning to in the future. But I think, but from what I've told about the storyline of Arrival, I think it may have the potential. But considering to where to where the where they turned this uh, storyline in in Valhalla, I don't think it would be. I don't think they, that's the case anymore, and which is a shame because, because in Valhalla, and I'll allow some criticism towards uh, the storyline of it. Uh, as much as I love Valhalla, it's actually my second favorite favorite Assassin's Creed game after Assassin's Creed Three, although excluding all the uh, post-launch content. Uh, <laughs> I think. Yes. I think uh, what Assassin's Creed Valhalla sort of disappointed me is that instead of really evolving this concept of language time as a language they just turn towards marvel like uh, different realities and calculations uh, which is again i'm not trying to say it is i'm not trying to say it's it's bad i, I like it in a way and again it, it it might actually have it might it might actually bring desmond back as we as we already saw in the ending of Valhalla, but I was expecting more in, in that regard. I'm not sure if that would be the case in the future Assassin's Creed game, if they would continue developing that that time language concept, uh, story concept. I wish I wish it would, but I, I but I have a, but I have a little faith about it mm. because mm. I think uh, where they actually going to is the is sort of the a second Ragnarok since we have like Basim as a reincarnation of Loki and Alethea reunited in the in the modern day. It is gonna. I, I, we've said this before, I think, on the show, but it is gonna be assuming this Basim game happens. Um, I I, I can't wait to see what the modern day story is. Like you say, we've got Basim, we have Alethea and her consciousness in, in the staff. You know, what are these two going to do? What chaos are they going to cause? Go on, Declan. Uh, I just wanted to say a couple of things. With the um, final reveal in Valhalla, with the multiple calculations, I personally, in my opinion, think that was the best thing for the franchise. Because... Now they could do spin-off what-if games and just call them calculations without actually breaking canon. So they could have like a calculation where Desmond didn't die, a calculation where Arno and Shay Cormac actually meet, 
and they'll all still be in-house canon games because they'll just be calculations. Um, with Basim being alive, and I don't know if you'll know much about this Bengar or your opinions on it, but will this now actually help the series break out from the stale Assassin's West Templar modern day and finally throw in the instruments of the first will into the Assassin's Creed games, which mm. are needed because the instruments of the first wills are the ones who helped Juno come back. Bringing that sort of storyline into the games to help Bastion and Alifia find a body could actually be a bit more fresher for the franchise and offer a little bit more Easter lore into the modern day instead of just keeping it as Easter eggs for the past. Uh, I say I would say this on that regard. Uh, I do think it has some advantages in terms of like this time, different time realities, calculations, and possible realities. It has its advantages, but I think assess, but I think Assassin's Creed uh, story writers are tread are uh, go are uh, walking on a mighty thin ice because uh, it uh, you can uh, it, this is very dangerous ground. To walk, uh, and uh, it might bring more confusion. It it might bring, if 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 not done correctly, it might bring more confusion for the assassins, uh, for the uh, for the fans, and and even for the, for the casual gamers who just who are just playing Assassin's Creed, uh, like as an annual annual or uh, like in a annual release or not in an annual release and just just play as a script because it's like an interesting game and not going towards and not going hard as a hardcore fan to to it uh but but i do agree with the fact that bringing uh, basim as a reincarnation of loki and reuniting him with alethea completely refresh it, it is a refresh it's a breath of fresh air of the to the modern day, and it and in my opinion, where it, it where it goes is that we might actually see another Ragnarok, in the assass like proper Ragnarok in the assass in the modern day. Uh, I would also key, I would also remind you that we have Salakars from the dawn of Ragnarok, and considering their, uh, they they kind of remind me of uh, the pedestals from the Assassin's Creed 3 and the Valhalla in the in the Yggdrasil. Mm. Uh, I think I think it might also bring not only I don't I don't think it will bring Juno because again we already we've already seen Juno fleeing from the temple in 2012. But it might bring Aita back finally. It might bring uh, Baldur back and a lot of uh, New P and and a lot of those souls that Odin actually stored in this uh, in this Salakar in the Dawn of Ragnarok. However, how, however, it is also I'm 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 not exactly sure if that if they would follow this path. Uh, I would ra I think it would be much more simplistic and uh, it will be uh, sim something like. Assassin Templars uniting uh, with each other to stop uh, these uh, Isu, Isu reincarnations once more, like like we we've already seen in the Uprising comics. Yeah, that could be a very interesting story, couldn't it? If um, if the two t two halves of the well, the Assassins and the Templars need to unite to. Uh, to face off against Basim and uh, Aletheia. I, I, I wonder, though, would they go for a an apocalypse, you know, second Ragnarok story? Because, well, if they let it succeed, is that not the end of the franchise? <laughs> because, you know, Earth has been destroyed, um, which, you know, they can't make any more games. Um, I think I think it actually will lead to the reboot of of the, to the hard reboot of the franchise rather than complete end of the series because Assassin's Creed is a is a gold is a gold is still a golden egg of Ubisoft. Indeed, indeed, absolutely. So they and, and I actually and I actually maybe in the minority, but I think Assassin's Creed would benefit from the hard reboot because the lore has become too enormous to handle it uh, like properly. 
Mm. And they, t- they, w- they will be... As much as we... As much as I respect Dobby and uh, his team, I think... I think it really got it gets it really got to the point where it gets over it gets really bloated, and handling this would require a lot of care and uh, and you have to tr- and you have to be very careful when introducing something new because one of the criticism I have and I've actually realized with Donald Ragnar one of the criticism I have towards how they handle Isu law is that they're trying to cover as much as possible but they're not giving a proper development to something they've already created. So I'll give, I'll give you an example. First one was, as I said, the time, the time language and all such, such thing, and, and what was introduced in uh, Assassin's Creed Origins. It was a really good concept, and, uh, and, I, and I couldn't wait to see it, but in Odyssey, we, we actually moved, we completely, it was completely tossed aside and and there was another story with uh, with Layla follow pursuing the uh, pursuing the uh, what was that called uh, the staff of Hermes and the mm. and, and pursuing the uh, Cassandra's uh, uh, Cassandra's uh, a life so that and and then becoming and then becoming the owner of so the staff of Hermes and then Alethea and then introducing Alethea and such and what's <laughs> what's more, I really find irritating is that they introduced Alethea as sort of the Isu who's on the side of the humans but Valhalla com- almost overturns it and actually shows that Alethea isn't really better than Juno in terms of in terms of her own goals, mm. I mean, I mean, when you have someone united with Loki, that really gives you that it, it doesn't make them uh, a, a, like it, it, it. I can't say it doesn't make them an antagonist. So basically, there. I mean, as as of now, we have Basim and Alicia as an, as antagonists in the modern day series, or or, or, or at least they're anti heroes. This, of the of the story, and another another example of that of how Isu law is getting over bloated, but they're not giving proper care to what they've already introduced is uh, is actually the pieces of Eden, because I mean I don't think any any one of us would actually say how much pieces of Eden are are created in the and in the are created in the uh, in the Assassin's Creed universe, and uh, Valhalla is a perfect exa- example of it because we have Excalibur, we have Odin's spear, we have Thor's hammer, and yeah. uh, like the Nod- Noden's Ark, we have the Gay Bolg, is it from Ireland, and yeah. yeah. So yeah, we, they they're giving a lot. They're introducing a lot of web, a lot of Isu, uh, Isu weapons, and they feel like collectibles. But Isu, but we've 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 used to think that Isu weapons are something magnificent and something huge, but Valhalla, in a way, n- neglects that, and we and that and that's a sad thing to be honest. Because for example, um, I don't know if you read uh, the Sword of the White Horse, but I mean. If you've seen if you've seen the cover, you might have guessed that the main story was about Excalibur. And I've read. Yes. Yeah, we spoke about that. Was it actually on our last episode or the episode before? Yeah. So it's a, it's a new book coming out. It will either released recently or coming out very soon, isn't it? It is released already. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But the, and they've given a really good background to the story of Excalibur. Which I believe could have easily made it to the game, uh, and it would have, and it would have actually given uh, a good, uh, and it would actually let us uh, take care of the Excalibur, and not only that, but the main character, uh, but uh, the main character was uh, could have given. Uh, no, actually, it's. Not, not that way. Uh, I, I, you have to cut it because I, I just got a, a bit lost in the. <laughs> it's okay. In the speech. No problem. Uh, the problem. Uh, so yeah. 
with the uh, and the main character from the Sword of the White Horse could have easily introduced a sort of the DLC with the with a background story uh, and the and the missions and and also funny funny enough Sword of the White Horse gives a really good Assassin's Creed experience that like we've used to so, like Assassins Templars and such. And it also gives a good character development to hi uh, to Haisam. And again, Haisam was more or less a static figure in the in the in the in Valhalla main game. Yeah. Like he, he he had some cool introduction in the in the intro in the intro of Valhalla, and then he just we we uh, he's just staying in the hidden one house. In the in the Raven's top, and and simply you just give give him the key, collect keys, give him give him keys. He gives something back, and that's it. I mean, seriously, is that how you treat hidden ones, hidden? And and when Sword of White Horse uh, ha had the best, uh, had better, uh, high some character development than in the game, and instead it makes it the book. I think that was a big mistake. I just wanted to say, um, I, I do agree, from what I've heard, some of the lore that they put in the comics should have been put into the game, and I do really think Valhalla's transmitter has done a really bad job of putting a lot of lore into a comic, not in the game, especially the Forgotten Myths comic, which is like a prequel to the DLC. But on the topics of the Pieces of Eden in Valhalla, I think it gets complicated because Technically, Excalibur is just a fan service to fans because Excalibur has been known in the law for quite a long time since Assassin's Creed 2 because mm. it was known by the glyphs that Arthur Pendragon did actually own Excalibur. And one could argue, I don't know, James is going to piss himself laughing in a minute. <laughs> that oh, I know where you're going with this now. Carry Excalibur on. Excalibur written into the English law in real English uh, law in real life and Assassin's Creed law would state theoretically that King Arthur only became king because of Excalibur so technically Avos she should have been queen of England I know everyone's laughing at me but that's where that piece of meeting gets convoluted because there is such high profile real world mythology around it that was cemented in Assassin's Creed law back in Assassin's Creed 2 with the glyphs that added to Valhalla, I think, is more of a fan service than just saying, let's dump Peace of Eden. But I do think that all of all the Peace of Eden in Valhalla, the only ones that should have really been there were Excalibur, Odin, Spear, and Force Hammer. Because from what we know of the Isu law, that when the Toby catastrophe hit and the Isu shared the knowledge with the remaining human survivors, we would know that over time, any weapons or artifacts that Kiis who had on them would have been convoluted over time into human stories. That's just generally how humans go. So the idea of not of having Norse Isu represent Norse mythology, but not giving them their iconic weapons just because you don't want to over convolute the Peace of Edens, which I do agree with, kind of like takes away the fact of that a lot of this Isu mythology that we've seen from this filler is just human interpretation of lost knowledge that they just can't comprehend. Uh, I'd like to raise two points on that. So first, about Excalibur. When you mentioned about the background of, sort of King Arthur and such, actually Sword of White Horse covers it pretty well and it gives a really good story towards was King Arthur and actually and uh, I don't know if you read so I just I don't want to spoil I don't want to spoil so, <laughs> anything from there. <laughs> I but... feel like it might be one we need to read Declan because we've yeah. heard from from Vengar now and from um, a little bit from Andrew that this might be one to uh, one to read to get more of that history and more of that uh, backstory. I'll I'll tell you this: it definitely gives a lot of backstory, including to the King Arthur. And that's one of the reasons why I say when I why I said and even before it even before when it was announced, I actually tweeted the criticism towards 
why did it make it to the game? Because it could have made it could have been made a, a, an excellent DLC, and that was ac- and that was after Siege of Paris, which I uh, I believe was a lot really underwhelming for me. And then, you know, I'll I'll make a couple of points on on the DLCs. I mean. I've played both. I haven't played Dawn of Ragnarok. We've, we've, we've covered that topic a lot, Declan mm-hmm. and I. Um, I. I have such mixed feelings about Wrath of the Druids and um, Siege of Paris. I, saw, I quite enjoyed them um, as self-contained stories. I enjoyed like the little trading mechanic that was in, um, in Wrath of the Druids. It was sort of a fun little side activity. I quite, I did enjoy the um, the return or the the partial return of the the black box assassination missions. It's a shame we can't replay them, but again, that's a topic <laughs> for another time. Mm-hmm. Um, it did frustrate me that those DLCs did not in any way progress Avor's character, um, either her knowledge and understanding of the Isu or her knowledge and understanding of the Hidden Ones and their their creed. Um, but what you said there is such a good point. A DLC could be a prequel story. It doesn't have to be a sequel or a, a continuation. You could, you could, you could create a prequel that that tells the story of a piece of Eden. Why not? That would be a really something a bit different. I would like that. And what's even more, I would uh, say to this: uh, the main character of the Sword of White Horse was a female, and uh, having a sole female short story even though it's again uh, sword of white horse is a uh, isn't long but giving a short story with the with the gameplay like we've seen in assassin's creed origins like we we usually play as by we play as bike but there are some interjections with aya who has a predefined skills predefined skills and the web and and the uh web weapons the moveset and such they could have done similar thing to the main character of the sword of white horse and it would and not only that it would actually give a lot of uh develop it a lot it would it would be an excellent introduction to the celtic culture which is uh which is in my opinion and i love wrath of the druids especially because it's something because julie fowl is uh, is uh, my favorite uh singer uh and actually, and that's why. And actually, I love Wrath of Druids only because of the setting. And I, I forgive, I forgave everything to the uh, Wrath of Druids <laughs> only because of the island. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, going back to the uh, uh, Wrath of the uh, sorry, Sword of the White Horse main character, they could have done some sort of the short missions for this character, and uh, it would it would have given a lot of developing not only to the to the ex, uh, to the this piece of eden to the excalibur but it it would have also given an a development to the to some of the characters that are that felt a little bit underwhelming so for example it's not only heisa but valka as well they could have introduced uh, more uh, order of the ancients so targets and one and there are some story and there are some and there, and there are some chapters in the sword of white horse which could have easily made uh, a black box mission like we've seen in in the siege of paris and i think that's a that's a really missed opportunity in that regard it, it sounds like it. and i'll tell you this is a point that declan has made um a few times when we've, we've spoken about dlcs I, I in some ways they just shouldn't exist we should just buy the game for the money, play the game, and then, you know, move on. But um, Declan makes a point that, especially with Valhalla and Odyssey, if you want to understand Valhalla's setup, you, ideally, you need to play Fate of Atlantis. So ideally, you need to have spent more money on the game to to buy the DLC. Mm. But actually, you could completely avoid that problem by making a prequel. DLC. So it doesn't affect people that have spent 60, 70, 80 pounds on the main game because it's just a prequel. If you don't play it, you've not missed anything because you know where the story ends when you finish the game and you can move on to the next game. 
But for those that do want to dive deeper into maybe the main character's um, backstory, or like you've described, a different character, but whose whose story kind of leads up to Eivor's time in England, it sounds perfect. I think it's a really interesting idea. Uh, well, speaking of Fate of Atlantis, as much as I like some of the elements of it, and I, I, per I personally was a, a huge fan of Phoebe arc, not only in the main game, but in the Fate of Atlantis as well, and I think uh, Fe Phoebe's story was... Uh, maybe the best part in the Assassin's Creed universe since Syndicate. I mean, if you're talking about self conduct uh, self-contained story, and only and the short in the short arc. Mm. Uh, I think Fate of Atlantis, in terms of how they've done it, like I mean, three chapters, a lot of grinding and such. It really, it really gets, it really got irritated, and of course. The infamous uh, conclusion of the modern day story when Layla completely <laughs> when Layla, uh, uh, smashed Otzenberg's back is, is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, she kills Victoria Bibo and then she, well, we assume, well, he's he's a uh, we've covered this, haven't we, Declan? Otzenberg is alive and he's mobile. Yes, and he's mobile, but he is he mobile with some sort of biomechanical suit or something i forget now i think again i think that's covered in a comic isn't it I th no it's actually been covered in the table game the one that brotherhood of venice ah, that's it that's it and i think we're going to be doing an episode on brotherhood of venice quite soon we hope anyway um with a guest we've had on before uh, lord Rayless will be joining us soon um to talk about brotherhood of venice so this will be very interesting to get um some of that uh that modern day um filling in the gap between odyssey and then when valhalla starts so yeah very good very good uh so i would also like to touch the another ex uh, and final example that i would give in terms of like the broad topic of isu Cover, covering everything of Isu and trying to cover an ever, as much as they can, but not developing the, but not developing what they already have is the Isu language. I mean, the one mm. that's in Valhalla, mm. because uh, because uh, I would I would say this first and foremost. I think Isu language has been the best thing that happened to Assassin's Creed in terms of the community. Uh, cooperation since the initiates website because like we've done like as access the animals done their incredible work of translations we've done our work on transliterations and uh, I don't know if you've seen but uh, do you remember the in the siege of Paris there was a Saint Denis mess issue message and, yes, there was. It actually, yeah. and it actually led to the discovering the uh, QR code in the Saint Denis in yeah. real life. And there so, was a little plaque, wasn't there, that had been put on the church in in real yeah. life. Yeah, that was awesome. And uh, and and the Reddit community sub and the Assassin's Creed subreddit actually you actually took an active part in deciphering all this. Mm. And I think. Mm. Again, accidents did their own work, but what I really love, what I really loved, is that the community finally wake woke up and decided to to do the work themselves as well, because that's <laughs> <laughs> because that's actually been my sort of the criticism towards the community, because right as of now we have like if something if if there's a puzzle coming in, uh, most of the people like say, all right, we have it, we'll wait for access the animals translations as soon as they done it will will then make the conclusions again i don't i don't just I, I don't judge them again they they have the right to think that way but i i but i think the why community but i think why the community exists is because we've is, is because we need to solve this together and that's what brings every one of us uh, that brings ev every one of us together and uh, makes the connections that we then cherish in the future. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so one of the and actually, isotransliterations are a per perfect example because 
the the foundation that I that our team laid, it was developed further. Like uh, one of the as I've said the uh, the author of the Codex uh, Transferendum, uh, he ha he actually managed to decipher one of the transliterations, even though we didn't have any of it in the DLCs. We've had only like Isu language and the English translations. Uh, that and uh, and as of now, Isu language uh, has a very unclear future because, as you might know, Antoine Hanoui left Ubisoft. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure who exactly will continue work, uh, continue its work on it. Because I've heard that he passed, uh, he passed it to some of the people who helped him. And I sincerely wish all the best to them, and I hope they will continue working on it. But, but I have my, uh, but I have my skept uh, skepticism towards it. I hope I'm wrong, of course. Uh, and like in the future, we'll, we'll, in the future. ISU language will need to be developed from the scratch. I mean, for example, we have ISU language, but it's Nordic specific ISU language. But what, what about the Mediterranean ones, for example, or the North, North African ones? And uh, I mean, as you know, the ISU realms represent the continents. That's, that's also, and from what I've seen in Don of Ragnarok, the future is isn't optimistic because there was literally nothing of, of on the issue language, and it and it, and it's and that's also a hugely missed opportunity. Have they? I wonder. I don't know the. I I, I have watched all of Access the Animus's videos. I know they've they've built a kind of a automatic translation website, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many words actually exist in the vocabulary. Is it enough to create any basic sentence? I'm guessing it's not. It's probably very specific to the stories they wanted to tell through the Isu writing that we we discover in Valhalla. Um, do you know how many words there are in the vocabulary in total? Uh, I've seen not the uh, access the answer, but I remember. Uh, but I remember the latest uh, issue of the Codex Transferendum. I think there are like. It's definitely more than 100 words, okay. but uh, but that's definitely not enough. And I'll also point out that there are still some issue transliterations we don't know about. Because mm. again, there are no... Because again, after the Valhalla main game, we never had any, any sound representations. And some of it, basically, we had to deduce it uh, blindly. And so, that's, oh, so you're saying there are actually some some words we've not yet translated? Not the not the words, the letters and the sounds of them. Ah, I see what you mean. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Interesting. I wonder if uh, is that the, the 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 guy that created the language was Antoine Henri? Antoine Henri, yes, yes. Okay, I wonder if he knows what they sound like in his head, or did he kind of just leave some gaps in his own knowledge for people to? No, to I definitely. So. No, actually, I did. I think he definitely knows. All of it. I mean, because uh, when the author of the Codex Transferendum managed to deduce one of its uh, one of the sounds, he actually came to his subreddit and he left a comment, like saying, "Oh, look, you actually you you're very close to the uh, to the truth." And then, after Antoine's uh, uh, hint, he managed to deduce it correctly. Uh, but oh, again, as I, okay. but again, as I said. How do we left Antoine left Ubisoft, and yeah. I have yeah. no idea how they will develop in future, and if they will develop it. I mean, for example, we all, we can we all, we already know that in uh, if you've noted if you've noticed in the in the Assassin's Creed Odyssey in some of the ISU buildings, like for example in the weaponry when we upgrade the uh, spear of Leonidas, there are actually some markings, and the uh, some issue markings which can be interpreted as language, but sorry, yeah, but uh, as uh, but as you might see, but again, it wasn't represented as an issue language because and like like it was in the Valhalla. 
So again, that's okay. So again, that's uh, that uh, the future of the issue language. As much as much as I love how it united community and all this, I'm not I'm not sure if it's going to be developed uh, further. Again, I hope I'm wrong though on, on that uh, on that part. Mm. Mm. So yeah, that's basically what covers my criticism towards how they developed ISO law, and I think especially especially with how they add more and more content to the ISO mythological layer, like in, as we've seen in Valhalla, uh, it it was represented correctly, but they just added too much, and that's uh, and and the rest of it uh, suffers. Yeah, it's almost a bit for me personally. It, it's all become a. It, I need my my stories a little more direct, and when it starts to become through one or even two layers of abstraction, I start to lose interest in trying to understand and interpret what I'm seeing. But that's just me personally. There are plenty of people out there who have really enjoyed it, and that's great. Yeah. Um, what I'm let me ask let me ask a sort of a more open question. And so we, we've had a lot of um, Isu history and so on explained to us and presented to us in Valhalla. Look, well, a fair bit in Odyssey, some sort of hints in Origins. Um, looking back to the older games, which games stand out to you, or or which transmedia stands out to you as also giving us a lot of history and stories about the Isu? Huh. Well, I think the first uh, thing that comes to my mind is Assassin's Creed 3 because of the Juno uh, cutscenes in the in the in the modern day temple. Mm. Because they they were basically what gave us a lot of the foundation on the, on how we saw how we see Isu and such. Uh, uh which was the another one? Uh, I'm trying Assassin's... to think myself because even Black Flag. No, definitely not Black Flag. I think it's, it's... basically none other than the observatory exists. Yeah. Well, well, we do get the whole set. Actually, we do get sages. That's a very good point. So we do get eighters. No, I think um, I, th I would say so... I may say unpopular thing, but sages were better introduced in the Assass uh, were better described in Assassin's Creed Unity. Because Ooh, okay, the, I mean the introduction was good, but the the biggest highlight of the sages, in my opinion, was in Assassin's Creed Unity, or uh, because the German storyline and how it's uh, how it's actually parallel and the and the references to Jacques de Molay, who was all, who was also a sage, by the way. Yeah, I think it's been really amazing. And actually, Unity is, I think, is my third favorite, favorite Assassin's Creed game. And uh, uh, so, besides Assassin's Creed, <coughs> besides Assassin's Creed Three, I think Assassin's Creed Two was more or less good on that mm. because of the not only because of the Minerva, Minerva, and all this, but uh, but also the tru the truth glyphs. They were like, I think Truth Glyphs is was the best thing in Assassin's Creed, you know, in general. But but while Brotherhood were, were focused on the on the actual events and how it was uh, produced in terms of, in terms of the Assassin's Creed universe, Assassin's Creed Truth Glyphs, they were actually focused on the issue technology. And the issue background, and that was and that was absolutely amazing. That was another thing that I come up in mind. Other than that, uh, Assassin's Creed One had almost none of it. Yeah. Brotherhood, also not really. Uh, Syndicate is is just a nightmare in terms of issue. Like there was nothing, nothing really, nothing. <laughs> Do you know, I was just thinking of Syndicate, and I was thinking. Because I, I just finished replaying Syndicate a few months ago, and I was thinking when you were describing the games, I was thinking, what is there in Syndicate? Well, there's the Shroud, of course, 
but there's actually no as far as i remember there is no discussion and no exploration of the first civilization at all is there in syndicate uh i mean there was a part of with lydia fry oh memories. my god how could i forget that <laughs> of course but but um, again but again it was just a self-contained story uh which i personally love it but because mm. but i love it because it was actually the first proper assassin's creed part in 20th century yes yeah i love that sequence it's one of my, i mean i think actually I'm not sure if we've covered, we haven't actually discussed, we, we've got this on our list of episodes to do at some point, which is um, sort of a syndicate revisited and to talk about the Lydia Fry story. That, like you just said, that Lydia Fry sequence was so much fun. I have to yeah. say it was such a satisfying and fun little story. What is it? It's only six sequences, I think, maybe two hours of or three hours of. Yeah of play but yeah very very enjoyable Always i'll, I'll actually thing. i'll actually show a second when i uh, we played syndicate for the second time after i finished uh, the main storyline i literally i literally went to this uh, 20th century part to this small open world and i just didn't uh, get, get back to the jacob and lydia fry because i was just running around the rooftops and enjoying the 20th century in assassin's creed yeah absolutely and i think they did a really nice job with and it's a simple thing but it was great to see how they integrated the um the power lines um yeah. as a parkourable you know surface yeah. Um, simple thing, but nice, like you say, nice to see a little bit of that early modern or modern day, um, but still with all the assassin things that we're used to, like parkour and, and stealth and so on. Yeah, it, it was a high point for me, I must say. Oh, uh, as for the transmedia, I think as uh, uprising was good, but sometimes it went a bit cringy, to be honest. And <laughs> what, <laughs> what, why was it cringy? <laughs> Well, I mean, I remember the sequence with uh, Juno, Jupiter, and Minerva, if I remember correctly, and how it was presented. And it was some some sort of this super heroic <laughs> uh, stuff, which, again, I don't think that fits Assassin's Creed. And I think the entire Uprising story is, is maybe some part of it was good, but some part of it I just completely hate. Like for example, we have Charlotte de la Cruz who falls from the thirteenth thirtieth uh, floor and and is still alive. We still we have wow. uh, right. uh, we have uh, Kohinoor, which suddenly awakens some another power that we haven't seen before, and in <laughs> and uh, so yeah, it's, so yeah, uprising is. Is not a high, uh, is not a, it's not among the highest. But what 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 is is the conspiracies and Bloodstone because they uh, because as I said before the fact that how they showed Apple of Eden, and uh, as a predecessor of the Animus, which is so basically Eden's technology used to observe the memories of the past. I think this is. I think this was one of the best contributions to the ISU law it had among all the transmedia. Okay, and that was, sorry, that was which um, series of comics? Uh, it was uh, Conspiracies and Bloodstone. It's basically, Bloodstone. Uh, basically it's an Eddie Gorms arc with the story. Oh, from the Second World War, uh, yeah. like you were describing earlier, the Philadelphia experiment, all that yeah. stuff. And okay. and also and and the, and the following was the Vietnam War. All oh, right, right. So yeah, if you haven't, so yeah, if you haven't read it, I strongly suggest you to read it. It's absolutely yeah, amazing story. I tell you, it's uh, comics for me. I I don't really get on with them, but we we've had so many conversations recently where we've discussed content that and stories that come from the comics i think i'm just gonna have to try i'm gonna have to find them either electronic versions or or i don't even know if it's possible to buy them um i guess secondhand it might be um and i think i'm gonna have to read some of these just to get the proper um <laughs> the proper story let's say yeah. and i'll just uh, if you uh, if you'd like to uh, uh, 
I don't know if, uh, what's your, what do you think of the Assassin's Creed movie, but actually there are some references to the Assassin's Creed movie in the conspiracies, conspiracies and Bloodstone. Ah, nice. I, I thought, I, I think actually we may have even discussed this just last week, but I'll just very briefly say that um, the first time I watched the film, I thought it was pretty poor and actually I watched it a second time and I thought it was pretty good. Um, mm. So I, I think they did a decent job um, bringing this complex universe to the big screen in just sort of two hours of runtime. So yeah, I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, after the um, uh, and I haven't read the Forgotten Sons comics. I th actually, if we speak on the Valhalla Transmedia, I've read only Sword of the White Horse. I haven't read Game of Saga mm. yet because again, I I I absolutely respect M Matt Kirby because again, because Last Descendants are is one of my favorite ESO Transmedia. Oh, sorry, you know, favorite Assassin's Creed Transmedia. Uh, oh. And while we speak about this uh, last descendant, the Trident of Eden is another example of how uh, how it, it gets absolutely no development after the last descendant, and it has a lot of potential as well. The Trident of Eden. Now, yep. am I being an idiot? Because I don't remember that. What? what where is that from? When do we see that? Uh, it, it was actually, as I said, it was in Last Descendant. So basically there are three okay. thongs of, I think, fear, admiration, and, uh, God, I, rem I remember the, what was the, uh, the third Trident. I mean, uh, and basically what it had, it's, uh, so basically there was a story also about the collective unconscious and how it is interpreted to the Isu lore, because it actually, because, again, I don't know if you read it, sorry for spoiling, so for the spoiler, it's but, okay. Go for it. But actually, but it had Minerva in it, mm. and uh, and how it is developed and how the how it is concluded in the third book, it was really good and it had a lot of potential, or at least they would have given, or at least they would have had another transmedia with the story behind each of the tribe, each of the each of the prong again because at some point of time. The, the Trident of Eden was, was being broken and then each prong was traveled around the world. But, uh, and, and from what I've, uh, and from, from what I remember, it could have, uh, they could have given a good storylines, at least in the transmedia, for each of the prongs and how the history and how, how the, so certain history historical events would have been represented in the Assassin's Creed law. So, for example, in the first Last Descendants, we have a civil war where the where the Assassins and Templars were in hunt of the one of the prongs, and it then and it was then used by the next president of the United States, U Ulysses Grant, to will uh, to basically become the, I mean, to basically become the president. And uh, that was, and that was really good. I I, 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 I wish it would have given, uh, I wish the background for some of these tridents were actually, were given, were given a more background to it. But unfortunately, well, it is what it is. <laughs> Do you think um, just just on the topic, like you said, of um, oh my god, what's what's the the new book with Neve, the assassin? Is it White Horse? Yes. Yeah. So you said that would make a good kind of prequel, or uh, it's not a prequel. I mean, I mean, it's not a prequel. It's basically the storyline for the of the Sword of the White Horse was before the Wrath of the Druids DLC. Okay. Okay. So are there other um, comics or other stories from other transmedia that you think would also make a good kind of playable game story either as a as an expansion uh, or, or anything like that uh i think you're aware that not uh, not exactly the game but i think you're aware that the assassin's creed live uh, tv series are planned in the future yes i mean it's gone very quiet hasn't it um, yes well, who so, knows uh, what's happening so basically i when i when it was announced 
I'm hoping in my dreams that they would actually uh, put the last Descendants TV series on the screen. That would be an an amazing potential. It has an amazing potential to become some sort of young adult TV series. That would uh, and it and it's actually diverse because we have uh, African American white characters, African American uh, characters. We have uh, we, we and the other and the and they have and they're from different nationalities. For example, Sean is Irish, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. and and also and also it would act, it would have been a good homage to the Assassin's Creed Rogue because the first last descendants uh, in in the in the historical setting there is a Kajal Cormac who is a grand uh, grandson of Sheikh Cormac. Oh, interesting. And again, I, I think that would, uh, Last Descent would have been an amazing video uh, TV series, but not mm. a video game. Mm. I would love to see Conspiracies and Bloodstone as a video game, but I do agree with Dorison when he said that in that case, the gameplay should be completely different. And it would be something like Division, maybe. Yeah, gotcha. Because it's it's all modern day setting, isn't it? So, oh, well, yeah, more, more or less re than rel day. relatively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Understand. Uh, and so of course, I mean, and and also, uh, Assassin's Creed Uprising conclusion should have been in the games because moving Project Phoenix storyline <laughs> to the comics. I mean, <laughs> I, I won't I won't say anything new on this. Uh, no, a lot of people no. <laughs> think that way. No, I, I, it's it's something that wasn't obvious to me because I I've only come to the franchise in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. um, and I only finished playing through all of the main games towards the end of last year, mm. and I didn't really I also didn't play the games in order just just to make it even more confusing, so I hadn't really put the pieces together of uh, you know Juno and Assassin's Creed Three and seeing her in Black Flag and then there's you know stuff in rogue and then she's there in syndicate and then i played origins but because i played it out of order i didn't really appreciate that suddenly juno wasn't in the games and it was only i think it was and i forget who it was because i have many different conversations with people on, on different platforms and we chat to people on this show all the time but um i remember someone saying oh yeah juno juno's dead she's uh, what oh and it yeah. was only then it occurred to me we had juno and then we didn't have Juno, and someone said, "Yeah, she was. It was in a comic." I was like, "What the? You've got your main antagonist, who is, you know, terrifying and scary, and you know, bent on domination." And yeah, anyway, nothing new there to discuss. It's a, it's a strange decision. Yeah, Let's hope we don't do any of those I, in the future. I actually, uh, I was I was present in the uh, global community when the uprising storyline story was developing. And you you have no Understood. idea how much shitstorm uh, has been on the on the subreddit and all the forums. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what are you looking forward to, perhaps in the future? Then, Vengar, we we don't we may have a game this year. We don't know for certain, but it seems it seems likely. Are you looking for more Isu backstory and development, or are you hoping just for a kind of a a very simple you know, assassins game with modern day in the historical section. What are you looking forward to? Uh, I actually, I'm actually excited for the Assassin's Creed Rift because I hope because I think it's a given that we'll have a story of Bas Basim and how Loki took over his mind. I mean, why else would they make a prequel of the of him? Uh, that's that's that. Uh, also. In terms of other games, I would I hope I hope that in the future, and that's just my personal wish, I would see the uh, Irish War of Independence setting in the Assassin's in the Assassin's Creed game, or at least in Transmedia. Ah, again, yeah. because that's my favorite. That's my favorite uh, setting that ha ha that didn't have uh, anything yet. And also, let me remind you that one of the unit in the Helix uh, screen in Assassin's Creed Unity when you just launched the game. Yes. Yeah, it was a uh, Helen Hibernia, and that's yes. 
that's absolutely ex excited. <laughs> I will, that's, yeah. that's just my dream. Yeah, we had, I'll tell you, on that topic, we had Darby McDevitt on the show um, ooh, a month ago. Mm -hmm. And we, we hadn't planned to talk about the Helix Navigator, but it, it popped up in conversation. And Darby mentioned that he had written the titles for the games that you see on that screen, yeah, including Helen Hibernia. And, and when he was writing it, that was his thought, that it could be a future game of Assassins versus Templars set during the Irish War of Independence, which, for, if people don't know, it's that period in the 1910s and early 1920s when um, Ireland gained their independence from the UK. <laughs> but he made a very good point, which is when you tell... the 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 wounds of that civil war and that independence period are still quite fresh and therefore it's probably better not to try and put certain historical characters into certain boxes um which could offend people could be insensitive so i think from his point of view it, it's probably a bit too recent at least to do in a game maybe you could do it in in transmedia in a different way but as, a, as an interactive kind of you know front you know game on a on a on a shelf in a game shop it's probably too too recent to uh to do sensitively and correctly actually i haven't said that to many people but i i think it would be good to say it now i've been writing a huge fanfic on the assassin's creed hell and i call it hibernia Oh, which nice. Is, and the, which is actually, will, will actually cover the Irish War of Independence and the role of assassins in this war. And I, I don't know how, how, when it will be ready, because again, I planned to write this. It will be a huge fanfic, like 200, 300 pages. And again, we will wow. have our personal lives. So, with, and one of the, so one of the ideas that I had like in 2020 is that I wanted to visit Dublin and to, mm. in order to, to visit the country, to visit Ireland once again, I was in Ireland, but very, but, uh, but it was long time ago. So I wanted to visit Dublin, Cork, Galway and, and other cities. But, I, but again, pan, but, but pandemic happened and all my yeah. plans went to hell, went to shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I wanted, to, and I also wanted to uh, to make this story as controversial as possible because, again, I'm not a Ubisoft employee or I'm not Ubisoft <laughs> affiliated employee, so I can Ubisoft. write whatever I want with respect to the canon and and to the law of Assassin's Creed. Of course, I'm not going to devi deviate on that. Uh, but if we exclude the Assassin, if we exclude Ireland in terms of the games, I would. I won't say anything new again, but I'd love to see uh, medieval Japan. Oh, yes. Yes. So the, the answer I hear a lot now from people, I haven't played it, but as soon as someone says, let's do Assassin's Creed in Japan, <laughs> people say, go and play Ghost of Tsushima, um, which I haven't played. Have you played it? Yes. Yes, I've we played it twice and I've actually played it in the, I've played it on the release and then a few months later. Um, I understand. Oops. Yeah, I, I understand why people compare it to the Assassin's Creed and for the right reasons. But uh, I, I may say something that people who absolutely adore Ghost of Tsushima may not like. But Ghost of Tsushima remind me why reminded me why I hated some of the parts of the old style Assassin's Creed games. Into Ooh, controversial. <laughs> yeah, it is controversial, yeah, because the open world has been done exactly like in the old the the old the open world of Ghost of Tsushima is the is almost everything worst that had that we were having in Assassin's Creed games pre pre syndicate. Like repetitive quests uh some of the these question marks that in then then turns out to be that like they're not really useful open world is i think more isn't that interesting in terms of exploration but i i mean i mean in terms of this quest a side quest and such of course we're talking about the visuals uh like battles or 
battles and and all that it is absolutely amazing like that i i i, I absolutely agree with every single place that comes comes about it but there are parts but basic but yeah there are parts which i really dislike and i and they really remind me in the ba- in a bad way the old style Assassin's Creed games i at the, at the same time i would say that i'm kind of person who respects both old style Assassin's Creed games and new style Assassin's Creed games and i think each one has its advantages and disadvantages so uh, that that's that's to say that's what uh, I just wanted to make this clear because uh, some may say then to me, uh, "Oh, you're just a uh, hate of the old style Sanskrit games. You're not a hardcore <laughs> fan." <laughs> yes, this is when someone says fake fan or, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. You're a fake fan. Go to hell. We're not interested in your opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I get I I get that. It's I, I'm I started actually. It's, I I don't know why I started it, but um, on friday so we're recording this on on tuesday uh the 10th so on friday i decided just on a whim to to replay assassin's creed 2 which i've only played once and the first time i played it was a couple of years ago and um i'm having so much fun um yeah. and I, I i started with the newer games so for me it's it's going back and i don't have that that nostalgia feeling for the older games because i didn't play them on release you know i didn't even own a a pc or a console when when assassin's creed 2 and the all of the early games were released so i don't have that that feeling of nostalgia or taking back to my youth or anything but i'm having an absolute blast replaying it it's so much fun but also it's just such a different style how can you compare it I, you know you, i don't know if you can even make an objective comparison of this is better than that because they they are they're just so different absolutely you can say which one you enjoy more not a problem yeah. um but yeah it's it's funny isn't it there are definitely some things that are that are really enjoyable in the early games but then there are things that i really enjoy from the newer games so ah uh, it's <laughs> you, you're never going to make people happy with what is it 15 years of of releases and you know many different styles and and um changes to the to the way these games are presented so yeah, that's all good uh also also in terms of speaking what else i would love to see in the future games is actually mm. uh as you as we already have established in the in the law of assassin's creed the, the we have like each of the realms represent the continents so i would love i uh, i would love to see a set as an assassin's creed game in a setting which hasn't been covered in the as a realm, yes, and with Isu language, because again, that would be. I, I would really love to see community once again working together, and instead, instead of instead of just waiting until someone translates uh, for them. Because I always push. Uh, because what I what I do with the when I do analysis and theories is I encourage people to be involved in the process of uh, making of uh, finding some new things and such i'll give you actually an example uh when we discovered the uh abochenus uh, identity mm, it, was, it, was, yes. it was me it was me and the and another one and one of our followers actually floric uh he uh, the two people actually contributed and expanded this theory and and gave gave this theory a, a more proof so the first one was uh, six keys who actually who spotted the in the database the oh confirmation yes. there's a little that, reference in there yes. yeah nice one yeah of course yeah the second one was uh I don't know who is ex- exactly. I think I remember the where Reddit hand username. It's Assassin Script. Assassin Script. As far as I know, he he or she again. Sorry, I don't know exactly the person. Uh, he or she is in the Mentors Guild. Mm. I think he's. It's a Spanish speaking person. So again, uh, I'm not. I'm not quite sure yeah. uh, about it. But uh, that person gave another hint towards the. Uh, uh, revelation that I also discovered, which is uh, 
about the excavations and how the uh, Isidore Mercator and the Bellator's Day were hunting hidden one's uh, treasures and trying to discover the, uh, uh, their hideouts. Because initially we didn't have that in mind. But, mm. but, but, but when she pointed out towards the, uh, uh, towards the I, dot I am in the ladder, and there, then I actually sat down and I realized, then I re wrote, wrote the letter once again, and I realized that the excavations that are mentioned in this, in this letter are related to the ones that are happening in each, each of these three hideouts in the, uh, each one, each one of these three hidden one hideouts in the, in Siege of Paris DLC. So when, so what I'm saying is when the community uh, unites and works together and it, it encourages more people to be involved in the discussions, I think that is, that shows why the, why gaming communities should exist and what, and what are their purpose. Mm. Mm. And yeah. I, and I, and that's why I hope that in the future there will be another interpretation of ISU language. Again, depending on if there are people like Antoine Henry who are capable of doing such enormous work. And, and then the community will once again unite and work together. And I think, Vengar, that is a nice way to end the show. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, we've had a really good chat uh, this week about well, all sorts of topics, but it's always nice to, to start with an idea, which was to, to talk about ISU and then to, to bring guests on who know a lot more than we do <laughs> about this franchise and just, just listen to their explorations. And actually what you said there, Vengar, about the community getting together and figuring out these puzzles that the writers and the developers um, have hidden throughout um, these, especially Valhalla. It's been, it's been great for puzzle solving. It, it's been fantastic. So thank you very much for joining us, Vengar. Where can, where can listeners find you uh, on the internet, on Twitter or whatever, if they want to follow you? Uh, right. So the, if you, so in Twitter, you can, uh, you can find me at twitter.com at Vengar underscore 0011. In Reddit, you can find me at, uh, my username is bull0011. Uh, and if, and if you want to subscribe to our uh, to our uh, fan page, it's in Russian, but Telegram fortunately recently added the auto translations. Uh, it's uh, t me uh, at uh, ac underscore initiates. I'll, I'll provide the links when you, you, good. if needed. Yeah, we can put them in the uh, video uh, version of this show as well. Yep. Um, so that's great. Um, Vengar, thank you very much for joining us. Declan, um, how's the voice, my friend? I'm alive a little bit, don't mind me. <laughs> so, uh, we'll, uh, just... we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there and hope you feel a lot better soon, mate. Thank you. I'm just in a lot of pain at the moment with my back. Who knew COVID would give you aches and pains? Um, yeah, but yes. you need to hang up the microphone, um, <laughs> get some rest, plenty of paracetamol, plenty of fluids. And I uh, hope you feel better soon. And uh, this episode will go out on Spotify and other podcast audio services on the 14th. And then our YouTube version will be published on the 15th. Uh, thanks everyone for listening and speak to you soon. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for inviting. It's been a pleasure. Uh, our pleasure is ours.